certified for the first time this past year. Okay, that's not as many. Who, sorry, this, this one's on the bottom row, bottom right, left-hand corner. Uh, who in here found somebody who's worked with Rosemary Cundiff on a grammar request? Okay, about 10 more. Great. Are we ready? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I'm Rosemary Cundiff and I am the government records ombudsman. I've worked at Utah State Archives for 16 years and my background is in history. That was my goal to work in archives and work with historical records. And four years ago when the legislature created the position of government records ombudsman, I was appointed even though I don't have a legal background, I do have background in records. And even though this isn't something that I anticipated doing, I've enjoyed it very much, working with you, helping explore grandma, and uh, it's been fun. The part of the statute that creates the government records ombudsman says that the government records ombudsman is required to understand grandma and to help the public in making grandma requests and appeals, to help records officers in responding to requests, and to mediate disputes. So in addition to that, the, the government records ombudsman is required to provide a, re a report annually to the legislature of the work done. And as I was working with this report, I thought about things that grandma isn't really clear on, things that maybe I think need more clarification, and one of those is fees. So grandma talks about uh, the, the legislative intent. I go back to the legislative intent over and over because that informs kind of how we interpret the rest of the law. And the legislative intent describes competing interests. So the purpose of the law is to balance the public's interest in transparency with private interests and we actually could see some of the phrases in the law. The legislature wants the, the public's right to easy and reasonable access to public records. They want guidelines based on way, the weighing of interest between what's public and private, between what should be disclosed and what should be restricted, and to favor access when all things are equal to establish fair and reasonable practices of records management. And to me, the intent of the law is to be customer oriented, to think about the public and to do what we can to promote, uh, to promote transparency, to get records to them as easy, make it as easy for them as possible. But the question in, is who's paying for this? Who, I mean, we want transparency, we want all this available, but who's going to pay? And the fees section in the law is, is 63G2203, and it goes through, um, you know, several things that I'll go through with you in, in a moment, but there's a lot of contradictions in a sense, and that's why I was thinking maybe the legislature needs to look at fee section again and get rid of some of the contradictions, but I come to think that the fees issue is also a balancing issue. So think about the legislative intent and think about what government can charge for, what they should waive fees for, and it gives records officers a lot of discretion. So it goes back to what Susan said earlier this morning, grandma is hard, because you not only have to weigh what you release and what you don't release, you have to weigh what you charge, how much you charge, and when you weigh fees, when you don't weigh fees, and that's challenging. So looking at the fees, uh, 63G2-3022 
establishes how fees are determined. So, point three. Fees shall be established as provided in subsection three, which this is. But if you are in state government, fees are established by the legislature through the Budgetary Procedures Act, like all other government expenses. And you would find that as a, a legislative act that includes, among everything else that is approved by the legislature, fees for records requests. If you are in local government, then fees are established by ordinance or a formal written policy that is approved by the political subdivision's governing body. So it would be the, the city council, the county commission will approve, uh, establish an ordinance or formal policy about what you're charging for re reports or whatever, whatever policy you have to establish the fees that your entity will charge. So, and here I've kind of got the balancing thing going. So the fee section starts off in point one by saying that a government entity can charge the actual cost of providing a record, but it, it, there's that re word reasonable in there. So and Paul already pointed that out, what's reasonable? So if government can charge the actual, a reasonable fee for the actual cost, then it also says that the, the executive officer is to approve that fee. So determining what's reasonable or not is, is an issue. So, and some of this Paul already covered, but when it talks about a reasonable fee, point two goes on to say what you can charge for the cost of staff time for compiling, formatting, or, or summarizing information, the cost of staff time for search and retrieval, incremental costs for uh, electronics, uh, electronic services for computer programming. But then, you know, we balance that a little bit by saying, well, you can charge for staff time, but it has to be the salary of the lowest paid employee with the skill level to do the job. And you can't charge for the fir first 15 minutes. And um, you can charge only a reasonable portion for com computer programming or reformatting costs. So you can see that we're trying to balance here. Then, uh, if you, the earlier section of grandma says that you're not, re, not required to create a record or, or reformat or package or summarize or tailor information. But then if you read further down, it says, but you may do so if you can do that without interfering with, with your business. So while it says you're not required to, you may do so. And so you have to think about whether you can without interfering with, with your business. And for the most part, records officers, government is doing that. They are summarizing and, and doing so much work to, to help requesters. But uh, point four talks about the uh, times when you can waive fees. So there's three instances where, and it says may, you may waive the fee and are encouraged to do so when releasing the record benefits the public. So in grandma, that is defined. Whenever someone makes a request for the purpose of getting information to write a story for publication in a newspaper or, or for the general public, then that is considered a request in the public interest. So the media has that, uh, that 
special consideration in grandma. So when the requester is the subject of the record, we're encouraged to waive the fee if the requester is the subject of the record. Or if the requester is impecunious and their legal rights are implicated in this record. So that's a, that's a two-way thing. They're both impecunious, which means they don't have the money to pay for it, and their legal rights are, are uh, implicated in the record. So we have this balancing because it says may, you may waive the fee in these instances, but you're not required to. So it leaves it up to government to decide, the chief administrative officer. So uh, then point five, we're, balance, we're going back to balancing the actual cost of providing the record is tempered by the things you cannot charge for. You cannot charge in point five for reviewing a record to determine whether it's subject to disclosure or for inspecting a record. So all of that attorney time that is spent determining a classification, you can't charge for that. So this is kind of like the same slide, but showing that, you know, sometimes the scales tip one way or the other way. And, and so, uh, this I already mentioned about creating a record. You may do this if it doesn't interfere with with your business. So you have to decide whether you have whether you have time to compile the information that someone wants to summarize it or reformat it. And if you do, then the requester should pay the fee for that. But then you can waive the fee. So here we go. So, another point in point eight, it says that uh, you can, or government can require prepayment if the fee is expected to exceed $50 or if the requester hasn't paid for previous requests. So that gives you an opportunity to you know, sort of evaluate how much you think this request is going to cost and ask for a commitment, ask for the money up front before you begin processing the request. So I feel like this is really important because sometimes requesters don't know exactly what is entailed in gathering the information that they're asking for. If they expect to pay $50 or $100 and you fill the request and it costs $500 or $800, then they might decide they don't want that after all. And so you're left holding, holding the records without being paid for it. So this is another thing that sort of gives government a, an opportunity to balance to require prepayment or to require the requester to pay for a previous request before they, you process a new one. So, uh, going, this is just reflecting back to the legislative intent. And I was thinking about a sort of a figurative thing to to talk about balancing. And this whole balancing of, of fees, uh, balancing and grandma all together, but balancing and fees reminded me of a teeter-totter. And I don't know if any of you remember, but this is what teeter-totters looked like when I was in elementary school. We had uh, a slide and swings and a teeter-totter, the, you know, the swings, the, and this is what it looked like. And so when you get on the teeter-totter, you have to have someone about the same weight on the other side or it doesn't work. And if 
the person on the other side weighs more or less, they have to move forward or backward or you can't work. You can't make the teeter-totter work. So if you, um, if you're riding the teeter-totter, you have to, you know, give a little jump and that propels you up and then the person on the other side goes down. And then when they're on the other side, they give a little jump and, and then you can have a lot of fun because you're, you know, going up and down. And that, that sort of, to me, uh, symbolizes what we have to do with, with, uh, with paying for this trans government transparency. Government has to give a little jump and give a little up, and requesters have to give a little jump on the other side and be willing to pony up and to pay for the things that they're asking government to do. And so uh, that's kind of an analogy. But I have one traumatic memory about teeter-totters. And that is, when I was in elementary school, like in this picture, girls were required to wear dresses to school. So I always, you know, had a dress with a gathered skirt because that's the kind of thing my mother made for me. And one day, when I was on the teeter-totter, I fell off when I was up. And my skirt caught on the teeter-totter, and so it just ripped my skirt all the way, practically all the way off. And it wasn't that I was hurt, but it was very embarrassed. And so, you know, those things happen. But when someone falls off the teeter-totter or things aren't balancing in the issue of fees, then we have the State Records Committee and 63G2036 says that denials of request for a fee waiver can be appealed in the same way as denials of request for records. So, you know, requesters, if they think they're the subject of the record or if they think that asking for this is in the public interest or they don't have the funds to pay and their legal rights are concerned, they can ask for a fee waiver. You get to decide. Do you give them a fee waiver or not? And if you say no, then they have the right to appeal. So then the State Records Committee can hear the arguments on both sides and decide whether or not your decision to deny the fee waiver was reasonable. And uh, so the Records Committee doesn't hear as many fee waiver appeals as they do records access appeals but they have heard some and I made a summary of some of the ones that they've heard and it, it seemed like they kept deferring back to the word may. All right, we can hear this but the governmental entity still had the right to, to uh, make this decision. So just summarizing a few of them. The committee determined that while it does have authority to, in, to enforce the fee waiver, it strongly believe well, the committee does not have the right to, uh, to enforce or reverse the decision about the fee waiver, but it believes that it should have been extended. Or um, at any rate, it seemed as though the committee was going back to this over and over, deferring back to the governmental entity's decision and uh, determining that it was the governmental entity's option to, to make that determination. So, but I just wanted to think about a few of the appeals and share some of those things with you. In, 2006, uh, Jackie Strait sent a records request to the Lieutenant Governor's office asking to, for a fee waiver. She had requested a copy of the voter registration uh, database. So 
the, there is a, a fee in statute for the voter registration database, and that is $1,050, or at least that's what it was in 2006. But the argument was, well, it just costs nothing to copy that on a CD, so why not the cost of the CD? And uh, the Records Committee's decision was, it's provided in statute that the voter registration database costs that much and that's, so that appeal was denied. Um, the, uh, another one that's more recent, Sam Allen made a request from Eagle Mountain and he wanted copies of the computer, uh, not computer, but credit card statements. He believed that employees were spending money inappropriately and it would be in the public interest for the public to know that. He's going to publish this on a website and so he asked for a fee waiver for that and the committee decided, let's see, the amount of the amount charged for the hourly rate for compiling this was $31.15 an hour. So the committee uh, partially granted this because they, decide, they determined that the $31.15 was for the, that, that included not just the salary but the benefits and the committee decided that it should have been just the salary and not salary plus benefits. So that was uh, partially granted. Wasatch, uh, see, Wasatch County School District got a request for email between the, the members of the school board and the district said that the, the time and effort that would be required to compile all of that, all of those email and provide that request would be $1,600. And the committee upheld that decision and that price. So I think that the change that Paul talked about in the law, this legislative session, that the State Records Committee shall review the fee waiver de novo, and in doing so, they shall also review the governmental entity's denial, but the, the it gives the State Records Committee the opportunity to look again at the denial of the fee waiver and make an independent decision about whether that fee waiver should have been granted and not just defer back to the governmental entity's decision. So it's interesting that the records committee doesn't really have authority to decide whether the fee is too much. So we can, they, you, they hear an unreasonable denial of a fee waiver, but they don't have the authority to hear that the fee that a particular city set was too high. That's still the discretion of governmental entities. And so here is a, if a requester and a governmental entity, if the issue is meeting in the middle, if you will, coming up with a price, because we're willing to pay something, but we're not willing to pay that much, then there is an opportunity for negotiation. So I'm sure that that's happening out there all the time. But as ombudsman, I've had the opportunity to work with a number of requesters and agencies on fee issues and to get together to talk about how much someone can pay or is willing to pay and to see if we can meet someplace in the middle. And that's an option that is beyond the records committee's decision. So that's 
that is a caricature that uh, City Weekly published in the newspaper when the, create, the ombudsman position was created, and that's my Halloween costume. And not bad, right? So do you have any questions about fees? That's a quick over. Just a quick question about redacting. Um, if you have something that's mixed private and public information, can you charge for the amount of time it takes to redact the record? I say yes. Okay. So we're, we're saying that you can't charge for reviewing the record, but for the time it takes, the physical time it takes like to redact it, yes. So, yeah. Rose, may I have one up here? Yes. Do, um, do an institution's grandma policies need to be ratified by the board like the fee schedule does, or is it just the fee schedule that needs to be adopted? The, the records policies, records ordinance? Um, so we were told that next year we'll be audited and we need to have a grandma policy in place. Does the grandma policy need to be adopted by the board or is it just the fee schedule that needs to be officially adopted? It needs to be adopted by the board. But it, if you have a records, uh, records policy, a local records policy, it should be approved by the board and a copy sent to the state archives. Okay. If you don't, then it just goes back to grandma that everything defers back to the state law. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. We had an issue that involved the financial people in our division um, not knowing what to do with money that had been collected by grant, collected as fees for grandma requests. And what do you suggest be done with that money? That's a hard question. Because it basically, the suggestion was that it basically was, you know, it was money that was unaccounted for and, or couldn't, yeah. And that, uh, you know, what are we supposed to do with that? You're messing up our books. Wow. That's a question I haven't heard before. Does anyone out there have an answer to that question? <laughs> Do they, uh, uh, are you talking about where do they put the funds for copies? Is that the question? Yes. How does that work into the accounting? So we have, you know, $50 coming in from a grandma request, and how, how is that so, calculated um, in the accounting? In Utah, the new town, the world in Utah, right? At the tax commission, uh, we have a fund. When people come in and just ask for copies of their returns and that type of thing, there's a fee set up for that that's outside of grandma. And so when we ask for a grandma request, we use we put that money into that same fund as we do when people ask for copies of returns. So we we actually have a fund there for it. Okay. Yes. yes, we don't have a fund for it, but what we do is we offset the wages that whoever it was that spent the time to fix it or to request it, it goes into their budget, into that department's budget. Okay. Someone asked the question earlier about if, if you charge one requester for compiling an extensive request, and they pay for it, and then someone else comes in and asks for the same thing, then what do you charge the second person? And the answer is you get to charge the actual cost for providing the record. So if you've already compiled it for one requester who paid for it, then the next requester, it doesn't cost you anything to provide it again. So I don't know that that's fair, but that's how it is. 
Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>